Welcome back to the Modern Ham, where we are connected in new old ways. Welcome to part two of our Modern Packet Radio reintroduction. The last video, we just went over a brief history of packet radio and got everybody familiar with the concepts of it. This entire series, if you haven't seen the first episode, is kind of built around making sure that uh, we have relevant data for packet radio and kind of a modern approach where all of the information is kind of consolidated into a specific area where a newbie who didn't know much about it can get started. This video is going to be all about the Direwolf TNC. It's going to serve as the foundation for all of the packet radios that we do uh, going forward on this channel. So I want to make sure that I cover everything that we need to talk about in depth. That way uh, anybody can go back and reference this video if they need to and get up and running. So if it's a little longer, I'm sorry. We are going to uh, apply a lot of concepts here to Direwolf that maybe you guys haven't seen before that have used it. And uh, it's going to be very optimized for packet use in modern times. If you guys are new to this, you need a sound card interface before we even get started. I am using uh, something called the DigiRig. The DigiRig is a little $50 uh, sound card slash push to talk interface that you can get online. The reason I like this is because it combines both the serial port of push to talk and the sound card into one device that's pretty modular. So that means I can take any radio as long as I have made a cable or can buy a cable for it and connect it to the DigiRig and the settings on the computer are always going to be the same. I'm not sponsored by DigiRig but I do recommend them for this purpose. You need to have a sound card interface connected to your computer at the minimum. Uh, if you're only using the box that's all you need. Although I highly encourage you to also use a push to talk line as well. If you are uh, using a push to talk line, your radio needs to be set up as follows. A push to talk line needs your radio to have open squelch, which means that uh, basically the audio is always coming out. Whatever it's hearing, it's just push it, pushing out. Uh, in either uh, push to talk interface or Vox, you need to have your battery saver disabled if you have it. Uh, that just cuts off the receive every once in a while to save battery, which could really screw up things on packet radio. You also need to be tuned to either a frequency that's not in use or 144.390 is a good idea as it's kind of the universal APRS packet uh, frequency. So if you do put it on that, you may be able to use it. So with that out of the way, connect your sound card interface to your computer. Connect your push to talk interface to your computer if you have one. Set your radio to open squelch. Turn your volume knob to about 25%. To start out with and you will be ready to rock and roll make sure i don't leave anybody out this guide is going to be divided up into a linux installation portion and a windows installation portion and then at the end we're going to combine uh, the uh, the two to do the configuration that's going to have to be done on both regardless so first i am going to do the windows installation since it's much faster so you linux users if you want to go to the scrub on the youtube video i've probably outlined the chapters and you can skip over to uh, configuration section after or you can skip to the linux installation section and start there you windows users uh we're going to go ahead and get started Everything that I do here is going to be based on a blog that I've already done that outlines all the instructions for all of this. So if you guys, uh, if you're not video people, you're just text people, I'll put the link in the description to kind of follow along. But we're going to go ahead and start right here on this installation guide for Windows. So the first thing after, you know, you have your sound card connected, your push to talk if you have one, is we're going to visit this GitHub link with Direwolf. And uh, the link for it will be below too if you don't want to open the blog. And we're going to download this uh, Direwolf x86-64. So I'm going to go ahead and save that into my downloads folder. Open up my downloads folder. And you're going to have a uh, RAR file or a zip file. So we're going to go ahead and right click that and we're going to extract it. And we're going to open up the, the next folder. Now... Uh, with your interface connected, we're going to go ahead and we're going to open up direwolf.exe. And uh, what you're going to notice, and I'm going to zoom in here, is it lists available audio input devices and available audio output devices. Only one input and one output is going to be relevant for your, your sound card interface. And you need to know which one it is. In this case, that's my microphone. This is my camera. I don't want either one of those, but this USB PNP sound device, that is my interface. That's what it's called for the DigiRig. 
So you want to note the two numbers here, one, and for me, it would be two. And that's because the USB sound cards on number one on the top and the USB sound cards on number two on the bottom. So I'm going to pull myself up a, a little text pad here and I'm going to say one and two. That way, when I go into configure the direwolf configuration file, I'll know what to put in there. Next, you're going to want to modify your system sounds. And I'll show you a quick way to do that. So if you hit your Windows key plus R, you're going to get this little run window. And if you type in mssys.cpl, it's going to open up this, uh, this window called system sounds. Now, you can also get there by hitting your start button and then typing in system sounds. And that will bring up this window as well. What we want to do is find the sound card out, which would be your playback tab. And then it's probably USB if you're using the USB sound card. And we're going to right click it and hit properties. And I only know it's this one because it says USB PMP sound card device. I'm going to hit levels. And you all may not look like this right now. Right click speaker and change percentage to decibels. And this is going to show your audio out in decibels instead of percentage. Now the reason we're here is because by default and probably yours is it's all the way up. When we don't want to completely send all of the audio over to our sound card interface to our radio because it's probably going to get distorted. Instead I like to turn mine to about 15 to 20 percent to start out with which for me, uh, I usually find a good uh, middle ground at about 17 decibels, or negative 17 decibels. So just make sure that you turn that speakers down, down, you know, closer to 10 to 20 percent instead of 100 percent. And we're going to hit OK on that, and OK. And that's pretty much all we need to do for the sound card configuration, or what we, I mean, sorry, what we need for the sound card. So if you guys are using Vox, hold tight for just a second. For you guys that are using push to talk interface, we need to go ahead and retrieve the COM port. So to grab the COM port in Windows, another little trick, you can do Windows key plus R. And this time we're going to type in devmgmt.msc. And uh, another way that you can get this window is if you just hit start and then type in device manager. Uh, you can also get here as well. So what we're looking for is the COM port for your radio, uh, for your push to talk interface. Now, this could actually, you might need additional drivers to see this. So if you have a radio, maybe like my Yaesu FT891 that I have behind me, you might have to go to the manufacturer website and install drivers for your push to talk communication port. You just need to check the instructions that you have with your sound, with your interface, right? One neat little trick I'm going to show you guys too, if for some reason your COM port is not showing up and you suspect it might be in under devices, you can actually type, uh, go to your Windows Update by going into Settings, Windows Update, Advanced Options, Optional Updates, Driver Updates, and you may see something in here that aligns with your COM port. That's actually how I installed the DigiRig on mine. I had to go in here and install an optional. So either way, you need this COM3 or whatever numbers yours is. I'm just going to put that into the notepad 2 as COM3. So now we have the instructions to send the direwolf for our COM port uh, and our correct index for our sound card. And we've also configured the levels. So with that information, we're going to go back to where we extracted direwolf. And you're going to see a direwolf.conf file right here. We're going to right click that and we're going to edit it. So you can edit it with notepad or you know whatever flavor of editor that you use. There's just a few options that we're going to set before we combine over and meet the Linux guys. The first thing that we're going to find is this A device 3 space 4 line. For me it's on the line 100. If you don't have it you can create it but I'm going to uncomment it so it just says a device, and by uncomment, I mean I'm removing the pound sign. And by default, it says 3-4. These are actually the numbers that we gathered uh, when we were getting our sound card index. 
So when you first ran Dire Wolf, and I'll do it again just so you guys see uh, once more, the index here for your sound card interface, it says 1, 2, because that's where my USB device lives. I'm going to replace that in the configuration file with 1, 2. Now, um, and I'm just going to close that out because I was just doing it to show you all again. The next thing that we're going to want to do is set up our push to talk interface. This push to talk line right here. And by default, it says PTT space, uh, sorry, this one right here, PTT space COM1 space RTS. We're going to uncomment that line. And that see that COM1? We're just going to use the COM port that we found before, which for me, it was COM3. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to type in COM3. Now you'll see this RTS. Now this can get a little tricky, um, but this is the, the type of signal that's sent to activate your push to talk line. So this can either be RTS or it could be DTR or it could be inverted RTS. So minus RTS like this, or it could be inverted R DTR, which would be minus DTR. Now, this is a little bit tricky to figure out, but I know with my Digi Rig, what works is RTS. That's what it's looking for. If you guys are unsure, you can Google your, maybe your radio model if you're using an onboard push to talk or your digital interface model and try to find out if it's using RTS or DTR for its push to talk line. Uh, you'll know you have it right when we test it later if your push to talk activates. If it doesn't activate, that means that just means that you're going to have to go in here and maybe try out DTR or try out a combination. You could be RTS space dash DTR. So just know if your push to talk doesn't work, come back here and try out a few other types of signals uh, or try to find it online if someone else has got it for you. Anyways, that basically does it for the operating specific um, configuration that has to be done. Now we're going to go ahead and regroup with the Linux users. I'm going to attach the notepad over here on the right side. And uh, if you guys go down scrub in the video, because I have the chapters highlighted, next is going to be the Linux section, the Linux installation. And right after that, it's going to be called configuration. That's where we're going to meet. So go ahead and skip to that part, or if you want to watch the Linux installation, you can stay tuned for that as well. Welcome to the Linux installation part of this video. We are going to be installing Linux uh, Direwolf and configuring it for either Debian, Ubuntu, Raspberry, or Raspbian Pi OS. Now I think that encompasses about mostly everybody, but if you guys are outside of that, I will refer you to the official Direwolf documentation where they have instructions to install it on other flavors of Linux as well. Now, as I told the Windows users, I basically have wrote up everything that we're going to talk about here in this nice little guide. I'll link in the description. That way you guys can copy and paste things just as I do. Or if you're a psychopath, you can type them out as I put them on the screen. So the prerequisites to this is that you have created a Linux user that you're not using, that that's not root that you're using. And that user is in the sudo group and you have sudo installed. These are Linux basics. Uh, if you don't know how to install sudo and you don't know how to add a user to the group, I hate to say it, but just Google it. Google how to install sudo. Uh, Google how to add user to sudo with your yourself logged into your user that uh, is in the sudo group. That's where we're going to start. And I'm going to do it in a terminal, but if you guys have a desktop, that's fine too. I just know that I'm running it in this GUI. So if you guys need to open a GUI or sorry, open a terminal, do the same thing. So the first thing that we're going to do is install all of these prerequisite packages. These are the ones that we need to install in order to compile and run Direwolf. So I'm just going to paste all of these commands in and um, it's going to ask for my password. And every time it installs a package, it's going to come back and ask me, Hey, are you sure you want to install this? Just because of the way, that I have it lined out. I've already got the packages installed, so it didn't actually ask. For you guys, it's gonna ask, hey, are you sure you'd like to install this package? Just make sure you hit Y and hit Enter, and it should go pretty smoothly. It's gonna install all those packages that I've listed here. Now, after that, we are going to uh, compile and install Direwolf. So one by one, 
first thing we're going to do is uh, change directory into our user folder in case we're not there already. I'm going to put myself right up here. Next thing we're going to do is go ahead and, well, sometimes my website does this thing where it doesn't let me copy paste. We're going to clone the GitHub repository. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that command in there. And once that's done, we're going to have a new folder called direwolf. So we are going to go into that new direwolf folder. And we're going to go ahead and change over to the dev branch. Uh, it seems pretty stable, so that's what I use. That's what I'm going to recommend. So we're going to switch a branch to the dev. And next, uh, we're going to create a new folder called build, and we're going to go into it. And now we are going to compile direwolf with this folder. So we're going to run the CMake command on the parent, and then we're going to run the make command, which could take a moment. And you don't really need to know exactly all that's going on here. As long as you can go line by line and read an error if it happens and know what to do, you're going to make it through this just fine. So next, we're going to go ahead and do sudo make install. And lastly, we're going to do make install comp. And we are going to cd back into our user folder. So if you do the cd tilde, right? Now, if you do ls from here, you should see several new files. And these are the configure. this right here, this direwolf.conf is going to be our main configuration file that we'll need in just a moment. But before that, we need to add our user to the dial out group. This may or may not be needed, but we're going to do it just in case. And what this does is allow our user to have access to com ports if they do not already. So once you paste that command in, make sure you replace your user with the username that you are currently using to run direwolf. And now we're going to uh, get the sound card interface index. Now, if you guys saw the Windows, it's kind of like what we did for Windows. But for Linux, we need to run this a record dash L. And that's going to return a list of uh, sound card interfaces that is currently connected to our system. So most of the time, your digital interface is going to be a USB sound card. There's different exceptions to that. Uh, if you guys are using some type of like built-in sound card in your motherboard. But whatever it be, you need two numbers. And that number is going to be the card number, which you see here that I've highlighted, this card zero. And it's going to be the device number, this device zero, right? And the, I'm only getting those two numbers from the USB sound, the USB PMP sound device. It could be some, name something else on your system, but just know that it needs to be the sound card interface that you're using for digital radio packets. So these two numbers we're going to memorize, the card number, the device number. And just like I did with Windows, I'm going to write those down. So zero, zero. We'll need them in just a moment. So next we're going to get the communication port, or the COM port, serial port, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to follow along, oh sorry, before that we're going to set our volume settings. And I'm following along with my guide, that way, you know, if you guys are following along here too, you can do the same. So we're going to run a command called ALSA Mixer. And what that's going to allow us to do is modify our uh, volume settings and uh, sound card settings in general, right? So once you have this open... If you hit F6, it's going to allow you to select a interface. If you have more than one, which you might, you want to select the one that corresponds with your packet radio interface. So USB PMP sound device for me. And if yours looks anything like mine, you're going to have a speaker, you're going to have a microphone, and you're going to have an automatic gain control. And if yours is anything like mine, by default, the speaker is going to be set to 100. We're going to turn that down to around 75% instead of 100%. This might be something that you have to play around with later if you see that your packets are not getting decoded by anybody. Your volume could be too high. So this is where you adjust that. 
The microphone setting, uh, if yours is anything like mine, it was muted. So see this MM right here? That means muted. So if you scroll over to it and you hit M again, it should change into this little zero, zero. That's what we want it to be because we don't want our microphone to be muted, right? And lastly, if yours is anything like mine was by default, your automatic gain control was set to zero, zero, which we actually do not want. We actually want that device to be muted because we don't want automatic gain control on packet interfaces. It really screws up the audio levels. It's not needed. Um, so we're going to just hit M to mute that out. And once you're done uh, with that, you have your mics unmuted, your speaker set to around 75, and your automatic gain control, if it's there, is muted. We're going to hit Escape. After that, we're going to enter a new command. And this is going to basically store those settings. So that's going to be sudo ALSA CTL space store. And now our sound settings are going to be saved and persistent. Now, if you guys are using Vox, which I still don't recommend, you won't need a COM port because that's for push to talk. I really recommend you do use push to talk if you have it on your interface, though. And uh, we're going to go ahead and grab the path for it that we're going to need. So there's a command here that's going to list all of your dev devices. So it's ls l slash dev. I'm going to paste that into the terminal. And you're going to get a list of stuff, right? The only thing that we're going to be worried about, and I'm going to assume that you're using a USB serial device. So that means like your push to talks over a USB. We're going to look for a TTY USB. So, and it could be several ports if you have more than one COM port. But for me, I only have one. So I know that this has to be it. TTY USB 0. Now, if you're unsure and you have multiple ones, what you can do is unplug your sound, your uh, PTT interface, your interfaces, and then you can run that command again. And then you can plug it back in and run that command again. And if it's there, whatever device is there afterwards, you know that that's the one that's definitely your PTT interface. So with that in mind, I know that I need this um, TTY USB 0. Now, if you're using a true serial interface, uh, yours would be one of these TTY S01, S2, S3. Uh, it would be one of those three. Now, uh, there's also a possibility that you're using a GPIO pin. And in that case, you won't have an interface here, but we'll set it in the code. That's if you're using a Raspberry Pi and you have got your GPIO pin set up for push to talk. Just know that your port, uh, more than likely, it's going to be slash dev slash TTY USB and then the USB number for your serial port. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down because we're going to need it in just a second. I know that mine is slash dev slash TTY USB zero because that's the one that shows up when my push to talk lines plugged in. So with that, we can now basically go ahead and enter a Linux specific configuration into the config file. So just to be sure you're where you're supposed to be, if you type in cd space tilde enter uh, and then type in ls, you should see this direwolf.conf file. That's the file we're going to be editing. So to edit a file in Linux, either open it up if you have a GUI and a notepad or something, or if you're in a terminal, we're going to type in nano space direwolf.conf. And um, there's a couple lines that we're going to be looking for here. So the, the lines that we're going to be looking for on Linux, it should be a device. So it, it's going to be the pound sign a device. And you can um, control W that uh, to do like a control F from the terminal if you want, which actually I'm going to do. So I'm going to type in a device. And this is the line that we're looking for. It should look just like this, a device plug hw colon one comma zero you're going to take away the trailing or the beginning space and pound sign so that uh, it's uncommented so to say and we're going to go ahead and look at those first two numbers we grabbed which was zero zero that was remember our card and device that we got when we ran the, the 
AL record um, command here. I told you guys to remember your device. So instead of one zero, I'm going to put zero zero just like that. And that takes care of my sound card interface. So next, we need to do the uh, push to talk. So to do the push to talk, what we're going to look for is PTT. And there's going to be a few options here. I'll show you guys the one we're looking for. If you hit control W enter, it'll keep searching. Uh, let's see. So this is the line that we're looking for. It should be pound sign PTT. Um, well, for Linux, it's slash dev slash USB RTS. So I'm going to go ahead and take away the pound sign from that third line here. And by default, this actually has the correct in, uh, configuration for my interface. So the path that we found earlier, uh, slash dev slash TTY USB zero, that's actually already in here. Now, I already mentioned this with the Linux users, but this right here is the tricky part, the RTS. So this is the type of signal that's sent over the uh, serial port in order to activate push to talk. With some interfaces, it's different. It could be RTS or it could be DTR, just like you see here. It could also be what's called inverted RTS, so minus RTS, or it could be what's called inverted DTR, so minus DTR. Now, with the DigiRig, if you're using that, it's just RTS. And if you're using what's called the Easy Digi, it's actually RTS space dash DTR. If you're unsure, there's a few different ways you can try to figure it out. The easiest is if you Google your sound card interface. So if it's an onboard or radio, you might type in FT891 uh, PTT interface RTS or DTR. And if you're lucky, somebody else has already put the answer out there for you. If you're not lucky and it's not in the uh, official handbook for your sound card interface or your push to talk interface, you might have to try it out until it works. And that's not too bad because there's only, you know, a few options that it really could be. But just know that once we go to test it here in a moment, if your push to talk does not activate, most likely you need to come back to this RTS. And I would first just try a DTR. Then I would try it again and see if it activates. And if that doesn't work, I would do minus RTS. And then I would do minus DTR. And if those don't work, lastly, I would try something like RTX minus DTR. Or I would try something like RTS DTR. In that order, one of those should get you up and running. But for me, and I think a lot of interfaces, it's just going to be RTS. Try to Google it if you can't figure it out. Try different things. Just know that once it comes to the testing part, come back here and change this if your push to talk is not activating. So, now that we have the interface for the sound card put in correctly, we have the interface for the push to talk put in correctly, we're going to regroup with the Windows users because the rest of this is going to be basically the same settings for both Windows and Linux. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dock this terminal to the left side. And you're about to see the Windows users pop up here over here on the right side. And now everybody's caught up. We all have our COM board set up. We all have our um, our audio device set up. And we can go on with the rest of the optimization. So see so you guys with everybody combined. All right. So welcome to the configuration part of the video. So this means that uh, if you're on Windows, you've already got your direwolf.conf open and we configured your COM port if you're using push to talk and your audio device. And if you're using Linux, we did the exact same thing. We did we opened up your configuration file and did your audio device and your COM port. So now we're going to take a look at the configuration that is shared between the two. And so over here, for Linux, I have the Linux configuration file and over on the right side I have the Windows. Uh, but they're basically going to be the same from now on. So we're going to go ahead and go to, uh, let's see, we need to do the speed. So in both of these configuration files, if you do a control F, type in 1200, by default, you'll see this 1200 modem, right? I'm going to do the same thing over here. Now, uh, because the HF speed limitations have been lifted, you will probably see a lot more 1200 um, baud speed on uh, HF as well 
So I'm going to leave this as default at 1200, but just know that if you're connecting to, you know, a BBS somewhere, uh, you need to match their speed, right? And traditionally packet, since we're getting ready to do APRS, it's upcoming, uh, that's going to be usually around 1200 baud uh, or uh, on the VHF band. So we're just going to leave that at 1200. That's the default. And you'll see up here where it says no call uh, right here uh, on both the Linux and Windows. We're going to change that just to our call sign, right? Um, so I'm going to do KN4MKB. And if you're just running kind of like a mobile station generic, I'm just going to put dash seven. Um, there is a reference to that. We'll get to it once we go into the next part of the series, which is APRS. But just know that uh, there's like different types of station in APRS and uh, or even just AX25. And we're going to be a dash seven for now. We won't get it too into the weeds on that one. So after that, uh, we've got our speed set up. We're going to scroll to the very bottom of the configuration file on, you know, whether it be on Windows or Linux, whatever you're on. And we're going to add some things, and I'm going to talk about what we're adding as we're doing it. So the first thing uh, is going to be, we're going to add FX25 um, TX space 1. So we're going to do that on both, uh, you know, whatever configuration file you're on. If you're on Linux, this can be the same from now on. FX25 TX Base 1. So what is, what is that? Well, there was an improvement done on AX25, and it's called FX25. The problem with AX25 is that if there's a single bit that is corrupted or, or missing uh, in a frame, it means that the entire frame is bad and it's going to have to be resent. So FX25 actually improves it on AX25 so that there's an extra bit of information on the header of the packet that allows for more uh, bytes to be corrupted or missing, a little bit more redundancy, and the frame still be repaired. So setting that value to 1 uh, allows Direwolf to take a ratio in the background, and basically, depending on the packet size, it will decide how much extra data to add. This will kind of slow down connections a little bit because the, the data size is going to be more, but it's backwards compatible. So any existing TNC will be able to still see the AEX25 frame that exists within the middle or inside of the FX25 frame. Uh, and it's going to allow a lot more redundancy with other systems that support FX25 uh, because now you can have a, at least more than one um, of those bits be an issue without it actually being an issue. So that's what FX25TX space 1 is. So the next, we're going to add two more lines. And that's going to be persist 63 and slot time 12. And so, yep, once again, we're just going to add that to both. Now, I added both of these at the same time because they go hand in hand with each other. So what is slot time and persist? So basically, if you have a network with more than two uh, packet you know, computers, if, if everybody's transmitting at the exact same interval between each other, then there's going to be uh, no randomness. So if you have two stations that are scheduled to transmit at the same time, they'll just keep transmitting over top of each other over and over and over again. So the solution to this is uh, the program is going to wait. Before it transmits, it's going to wait uh, for the slot time, which I believe is 120 milliseconds in this case. Pro um, but it's going to wait, and it's going to generate a random number. Now, if this random number is going to be between 0 and 255. If it is less than 255, it's going to transmit. So if it's less, if this random number is less than or equal to uh, persist, the persist value is going to transmit. If that randomly generated number is greater than your persist value, then it's going to actually wait for the slot time again. And it's going to repeat this cycle over and over and over again. And that's going to allow a little bit of randomness. That way, if uh, another station's try to get in, yours might wait just a, just a few milliseconds enough for that other station to come in and have its turn. So that way, everybody's not just trying to transmit over top of each other in the same interval. So these are two good values to start out with generically. Um, the next thing that we're going to add is retry. 
So retry, what does retry do? So anytime that a, a frame is sent that needs to be acknowledged, um, if it's not acknowledged within uh, so many seconds, called the frac, uh, then we retry to send that frame. By default, Direwolf uh, has retry set to 10. And uh, I just personally believe that if after five times you've tried to send a packet and you're not getting anything back, I, my opinion is just kind of drop that packet because you ha you could have several in line afterwards. and You could have, you know, four or five, seven packets. And if you tried five times to just send one and it's not working, you're probably not going to have much luck. So if you guys are working with like slow connections where you are able to get a packet through, but you might have to try a whole bunch of times, you might set that to 10, which is the default. But that's, that's what it is. Uh, for when you you might need to adjust it so i uh, use the word frac and that's going to be the next thing that we talk about and the next thing that we add in f-r-a-c-k what is that well that's the amount of time uh in seconds that we're going to wait for a uh, reply to a transmission if we send a, a a transmission and we need an acknowledgement we're going to wait three seconds for that acknowledgement which is the default the only reason that I put it in here, so you guys may adjust it later on once you get into the more advanced stuff, and that way you know what it is. The next thing we're going to talk about is max frame. So I'm going to go ahead and add max frame in, and we're going to do max frame 4. What is max frame? This is the maximum amount of packets that we can send before we want uh, an acknowledgement for those packets. So at 4, that means we can send 4 packets. Uh, before we want a acknowledgement and so this is uh by by default uh seven is a pretty good number if you have a reliable connection as you can imagine if you have a very reliable connection you can really turn this up uh, and that will increase the speeds that you have but if you have a very unreliable connection and you turn this up you're going to cause a lot of problems with transmitting bunches of packets that never get returned and they have to be sent you know seven at a time again uh, so generally seven is a good number if you're on vhf and you have a very good connection with somebody whereas two is a good option for hf where things are a little bit uh, more noisy and you may not be able to get as many packets in a row out there so in this case i've kind of set things at four because that gives a good middle ground between HF and VHF and allows a lot more redundancy in your connection. But if you think you can bump it up, uh, you know, increase that. And if you think you need to bring it down, if you're in a very noisy environment, you know, you can decrease it down to one or two. So that's what max frame is. Now packet length is the next optimization that we're going to put in. And we're doing 128. So packet length, what is that? That's the amount of data that can fit within the data part of the frame, uh, the packet that we send. Uh, this can go, I wouldn't recommend going below 64, and I really wouldn't recommend going above 256. Um, typically, these are multiples of two. 128 is historically the generic amount of a packet, uh, packet length for just a regular uh, VHF digi uh, digipeter frame or an aprs frame 128 is a good solid number that's a, a middle ground between you know 256 and 64. i recommend sticking with 128 until you might need that you need to go up or down just like max frame if you have a very good reliable connection you can turn this up to i think it can actually go into the thousands but i wouldn't go above 256. direwolf has a default of 255. I think it's either 255 256 they have a default for now if you're doing hf i really recommend maybe getting close down to 64 and just doing 64 packet length and that will ensure that you have a lot of uh, a lot of room for more error uh, when you're sending those packets so 128 though we're going to leave as the middle ground for now the next thing i want to add in here is called d weight so what is d weight and I've set this at zero because that's the default. Uh, whenever you go to send a push to talk signal to your transmitter, this D weight is actually a value in tens of milliseconds. Uh, so if I were to put 10 here, it would be 100. Uh, that will 
basically give your transmitter time to actually turn on before starting to send data. Most transmitters uh, uh, don't really need this, but if, if you have a radio that has problems switching over from receive to transmit, you might, you know, make this 10 or 20. But I would adjust the other things that we're going to talk about here before we do D-Weight. So the next thing we talk about is the TX delay. What is TX delay and what is 30? So 30 is for 300 milliseconds. And what is TX delay? Basically, once we've activated the push to talk or, you know, if we're using Vox, uh, we send kind of a 300 millisecond audio buffer to the radio in order to uh, help stabilize the transmitter. Because if the transmitter is immediately switching on and it's sending sensitive packet data, there's a there's some transmitters that might just take a few milliseconds to stabilize so that they're definitely on the right frequency and, and kind of just warm them up if you think about it, just for a few milliseconds. And that's what TX Delay does. 30 is a pretty good uh, start. Uh, when it comes down to bulletin board systems and TCP over IP, the goal is to get these numbers as low as possible while still, you know, remaining functional. So if, uh, you know, we might come back and visit this and try to lower that in the future once we get into some more advanced uh, uh, packet things. But this is a good number for APRS and generic BBS software. Now, if, uh, if you start sending packets here in a moment, and you can hear the packet come over the radio on another radio and you're still not getting to codes, you might try actually increasing this by about 10 or 20. Um, but realistically, you shouldn't need to go over 50 or 500 milliseconds for most radios. So the last uh, thing we're going to throw in here is called TX tail. And what is TX tail? Well, it's the opposite kind of a delay. So at the end of a transmission, uh, once or at the end of your packet, as the audio is going over your sound card, your push to talk is scheduled to just cut off as soon as the packet's done sending. Well, TX tail allows us to kind of open, keep that push to talk line open while we're still sending uh, data, just in case the the back part gets clipped off. Maybe you have a really fast push to talk switch and it just comes off immediately, but maybe your audio is kind of delayed. What that would cause is the end of your packet to be clipped off. So this TX tail, a value of 15 means 150 milliseconds, which is a pretty good start. We'll make sure that uh, the end of your packet has 150 millisecond buffer before your push to talk cuts off um, or before it stops uh, not sending data. So just like the TX delay, if you have issues uh, getting uh, yourself decoded by other uh, stations, you might try to increase this TX tail all the way up to 30, but I don't see you see you needing more than 30 or 300 milliseconds as a buffer for the tail. Um, these are pretty good options as generic settings to get you started. It should work with most radios, but once we go in to try it here, just know that these just know what these do. And if you have another radio listening, this is the type of stuff that you need to listen for. So with that done, we are actually really able to just go ahead and start Direwolf. And uh, we're going to first ensure that we have working push to talk or we're actually, we can transmit out of the radio. And to do that, we're going to send a simple audio buffer over our, uh, our radio with Direwolf. So go ahead and save your configuration file from your Windows and save it if you're in Linux by hitting Control X, Shift Y, Enter. And now we're going to run Direwolf. So in Windows, um, in the future, running Direwolf is as simple as uh, double-clicking it, but we need a terminal open. So you can usually shift right-click inside of Windows and hit open in terminal, right? And that's going to open a terminal in the location where we're currently in. But if you can't do that, if you can click in the white space and get the path to your Direwolf configuration, you can open up a command prompt by typing in cmd and do your search. And just like Linux, you can do cd space and then right click to paste the path. And that should get you in the folder as well. Now, just like Linux, you type in, uh, if you're in a, a PowerShell terminal, you can type in ls 
to make sure you're in the right folder or if you're in the command prompt you can type in dir and that will show the files there as well so the command that we're going to want to run and it's going to be basically the same on windows and linux uh, on windows i'm going to type it out it's going to be uh, dot forward slash direwolf dot exe space dash x and i'm going to zoom in here a just like this right here now if you're in a powershell terminal that will get you started and that should also activate your push to talk on your radio which actually my radio isn't on so here you can see that my radio is transmitting this is transmitting a blank tone I'm gonna hit control C to stop it and that basically confirmed that push to talk was working uh, if you're in the command prompt you do the exact same command you just omit the uh, dot forward slash that's in the beginning so you would just do direwolf.exe dash x dash a. So direwolf.exe dash x. Misspelled direwolf. So yeah, that basically does the same thing. Now in Linux, uh, all you have to do is type in direwolf dash x space a. And just the same, your transmit should start. And I looked over just to make sure that the radio was transmitting. So that's how you confirm that your push to talk's working. If you have another radio nearby you can listen to, you can you should be able to hear the audio tone coming out of it. Now, that's if you have if you if your radio did not activate push to talk at all or you have no audio coming out, you have a problem. I will go check your com your com port and maybe swap around that RTS DTR if you're using a PTT serial line and I would also check your Vox to make sure that it's opening if you're not using a PTT serial line. Now, we're gonna actually, uh, to wrap this up, we're gonna send a packet. So we're gonna open up that configuration file once more, and uh, that's gonna be nanodirewolf.com for Linux, and then double click or right click edit for Windows. And uh, we're going to find a line, and this line is going to start with pbeacon, P-B-E-A-C-O-N. Now, there's several. The one that we're looking for looks like this right here. And let me make it a lot bigger. Um, it just says delay 1 every 30. Um, and then it has a latitude, longitude, and a comment. And it says wide 1-1 at the end. It's going to look the same on Linux. So I'm going to find it here on Linux by hitting Control w pasting it in and here's the line here so we're gonna change that every third first of all we're gonna remove that the pound sign so we're gonna remove the pound sign for both the uncommented is what it's called we're gonna change this every 30 to just every one and I'm just doing that just to test you guys make sure you turn this back off by adding the comment line afterwards otherwise you're gonna be beaconing every minute which could be annoying um, next we're going to go on over to this latitude longitude portion and uh, I'm going to show you guys a website that you can open it's called find latitude and longitude the links going to be down below and it allows you to just basically uh, type in a city and state and move a cursor around to get a, lat a latitude and longitude so you see this right here this map coordinates uh, it might be a little small. Let's see if we can enlarge it. So this map coordinates, this uh, it says latitude in 3741. We're going to go over here, and under the latitude, I'm going to put... Uh, over here, I'm going to look 37 and 41. Now, this is part, it gets a little bit confusing. I'm taking the 41 right here before the apostrophe. And then this 38, I'm putting that after the decimal place right so let's go over here to the la longitude and do the same thing this this first number 85 is going to go in the first number here this second number 51 is going to go in the second number here but i'm going to leave the decimal place and this third number right here ignoring everything after the decimal place is going to go after this de decimal place on the 
um, on the configuration file. Next, if you scroll over, you're going to see power. You can change that to how much power you're using in watts. The height is the altitude of your antenna. I'm just going to put five. And of course, the gain is the gain of your antenna. You can put a comment that's transmitting transmitted. I'm just going to put a packet radio test. And I'm going to go ahead and just do the exact same thing for the Linux line. And since I've already done it in Windows, I'm just going to comment it out. And it's the same thing. So I'm just going to copy this line here. And I'm going to paste it in. Now, once that's done, what's going to happen after we start Direwolf with our configuration file is we're going to transmit that beacon every one minute. So I'm going to hit Control X, Shift Y to save on Linux. I'm going to hit Control S to save on Windows. And now, we don't really need any command arguments anymore. To start Direwolf on Linux, we're just going to type in Direwolf. And that started Direwolf. And on Windows, we're just going to go over to the folder. We're going to make sure Direwolf's not running from before. And all we're going to do is just double-click direwolf.exe. And now we have uh, we have Direwolf running. Now, this test is to make sure that, one, you're transmitting packets, but also if they're somewhere on the receive end, they should be able to decode you now with a latitude and longitude. If you have what's called an eye gate around you, then you will be routed to APRS.fi, the website, which I'll show you now to check. The link for this will also be in the description. So I've put my latitude longitude about right here. So if any of these eye gates here pick me up, which they probably won't, I'm only doing it 5 watts inside, then I'll be plotted on this online map. So um, these digipeters, well, they could not also not be eye gates. They could just actually just be repeating packets. But the best thing to do is if you can test uh, is to make sure that when you see these purple, this purple here, that means that um, a, uh, you had a transmission, right? And so I have two running, right? So I have Linux and Windows running. I have two different radios, and they're actually picking each other up. So I know that my settings are okay. And, and so you guys see what that looks like. If you see this green and blue text, that's a station, that's a packet you've received. If you see this purple text, that's a packet that you're transmitting. So you can see that I picked up myself being transmitted when I've transmitted over here. And you can see that I picked up myself when I got trans when I transmitted here. Now you might see this audio input level too low. Increase it so stations are around 50. What that basically means is that uh, you need to increase the volume into your radio or into your uh, sound card interface. So if you see this message, that means that you need to turn up the volume on your radio by a couple notches. And I'll go ahead and do that. So I've turned that up a couple notches. Now, uh, you might also see uh, something that says audio input is too high. That means you need to turn down your radio a little bit. So just like I showed you guys uh, before in Windows and Linux, that's you need to go in and adjust your sound card. So last, uh, you should have working... Um, you should have a working beacon now going on. If you guys experience any issues whatsoever, I, I don't want to leave anybody behind in this series. And this is serving, it's an hour long, right? But it's serving as the foundation for all of the packet videos that we're about to do. That's why it, I made it so intricate. If you guys have any issues, make sure to let me know in the comments and I'll reply and see if we can't work it out. I don't want to leave anybody behind. Uh, just know that I also have a troubleshooting um, section on the blog where I go over some different scenarios of what could be going wrong. So you might get this error can't open device com device for push to talk control. That means that if you're on Linux either your user doesn't have permissions to use the com port. It, we didn't do the uh, you you maybe didn't do the dial out command to add your user to the the group or you have the wrong com port um, that's for the two that could possibly be going on there. Uh, if you see it in Windows, you probably have the wrong COM port. 
Another possibility is you may have an instance of something running using that COM port or another instance of Direwolf running in the background that you forgot about. So make sure you check that. Uh, if, you're, if your radio does not transmit and you're using a push-to-talk line but you don't receive errors, more than likely is you have the wrong uh, push-to-talk serial signal being sent to your push-to-talk interface. So we, I talked with both Windows and Linux users about this RTS and DTR thing. If you, if you experience this, make sure you go find your COM port and uh, swap it from RTS and try DTR out. Or try minus DTR, try minus RTS. One of those combinations should work because you're, you're opening your COM port. It's just not sending the right signal. So just try to figure that out. If you can't figure it out, let me know down below what kind of interface or radio you're using and we'll try to figure it out for you. So if your radio transmits and doesn't stop, that could mean one, that same problem here, the wrong signal is being sent to your interface and it's not turning off. That's one possibility. Or another thing could be something called RFI. So in that audio interface cable, uh, if you ha if you get RF into it, it could be triggering some type of, or even your push-to-talk interface, it could be triggering some eternal uh, push-to-talk or data stream that never goes away. So try to separate your antenna from your interface cables as much as possible. Maybe even try adding ferrite beads uh, or chokes to your cables to make sure that you eliminate any RFI that could be on them. Uh, let's see, your radio does not transmit and you're using Vox instead of a push-to-talk line. So Vox is supposed to be triggered by audio being on the audio cable coming into the radio. So first, obviously, make sure you have Vox turned on on your radio. And there's different levels of it. Try the highest level, try the lowest level. They're different by radio. Some of them are more sensitive on one end. Uh, next, make sure that you're actually, you have audio coming out of your radio to actually trigger that push to talk. Uh, you, you could maybe record your voice saying, hey, this is KN4MKB or whoever you are testing PTT over Vox and try to play that into the audio line to see if your radio doesn't activate. Uh, if it doesn't, you, you have a problem with your audio interface into your radio. It's not actually sending any audio. Uh, here's another one, your radio transmits, but no sound comes with it. This is definitely probably due to a muted speaker on your uh, your audio device configuration, or maybe the the it's just turned all the way down, or you did not select the right audio device as your audio out when we configured it. So another thing you might run into is your radio transmits. It sounds like a packet, but it's not getting encoded on the other end. So this is the fun one. Uh, remember when we went up and we set that TX delay and we set that TX tail and that D weight? So if you find yourself transmitting packets and you can hear the packet on the radio, uh, but you're not getting decoded anywhere, more than likely uh, your TX tail uh, is not high enough, so your radio is cutting off before the packet's finished, or your TX delay is not high enough, so your radio hasn't had time to really warm up before sending that packet data out. So I would start by increasing these by about 10 each until you get a decoded packet. Uh, one of these is probably your problem. Now if you get up to say 50 on the TX delay and you get up to maybe 300 milliseconds on the tail and you're still having issues, then start trying to increase your D weight by about 10 and then 20 at the max to see if that doesn't uh, help you out there. If, if none of these work, then there is another problem going on and I wouldn't know how to fix it unless I had more information. The, uh, the next thing that, um, uh, that might be going on is you're not decoding any packets. Maybe you are sending packets and they're being decoded, but you're not decoding anything. Uh, make sure the battery function on your radio is turned off because uh, this battery saving function, maybe it's disabling your receive every so many milliseconds, so it's cutting off packets that could come through. Also, make sure if you're using push to talk, Obviously, make sure your squelch is open so that your radio is actually playing the sound that it's hearing and all, all the time. It's, it's not just being quiet. Um, make sure that the microphone interface for your uh, sound card is not muted because the microphone interface is what hears the data coming in from the radio. And also, you might play with your radio's volume knob. Uh, it, it could be so loud that 
uh, Dire Wolf's not able to decode any packets, uh, or it could be so quiet that it's not able to decode any packets. Usually it's on the louder end. Anyways, I, I hope that I was able to help people get their TNCs up and running. Just so you guys are following, uh, I know I didn't do like any APRS in this video or anything with Direwolf. That's because this is part of the ongoing packet radio series. This is part two to get everyone introduced to packet radio. Uh, and this is mainly to get a really good foundation TNC set up that we can build upon with APRS in the next video. We're going to do a, a Linux APS, uh, sorry, Linux APRS through some software, and then we're also going to do some modern APRS through Windows through a program called Pinpoint APRS. I just want to let you guys know all the footwork is now done. The TNC is the most difficult part uh, in a packet radio system to configure, and once you have your push-to-talk and you have audio in and audio out, then you basically are home free. The rest of this is going to be a lot of fun, uh, and we can use we're going to reference this video every time that somebody has issues or somebody needs to set up their TNC or has questions about Direwolf. This is going to be the video that I reference. So if you guys have any questions or issues with what we talked about today, make sure to go in the comments and let us know or let me know. That way I can reply and maybe somebody else might need help with that too. So uh, it might be next week, but... APRS is going to be it's going to be all about APRS. We're going to dig into uh, interfacing the software with Direwolf. We might use a GPS. We're going to send messages. We're going to send position reports. We're going to send email. Uh, we're going to do a lot of fun stuff. So stay tuned for that. And uh, this is just to get again. I know everybody's wanting to get bulletin board systems and TCP/IP. This is a introductory course for everybody that's new to Packet too. So we're going to start off with APRS. That way everybody gets the warm and fuzzies, and then we're going to dig into the more difficult uh, subject matter. So anyways, thank you guys for watching, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I just want to, I, I got a few new YouTube members that I want to give a shout out to. Uh, I think they may be here for the course. Um, and some of you guys have some crazy names. So I'm going to start with Bart Killam. Uh, you've been a supporter for 26 months. You're awesome. Thank you so much for being on the channel. Van Flick. I think I've maybe finally memorized your name. Thank you. Google must die. Uh, Hinil Vanderwalt. Um, Scott Pasternak. And deletion scheduled Scott Pasternak. Um, and I still hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Thank you for being a member of the channel. It looks like y you have both. Both of your accounts are still subscribed. Just a heads up. And uh, Lionel. Uh, thank you for being a member, and I'm just going to call you Johnny. Johnny, thank you for being a member of the channel. Sorry I couldn't get the first part of your, your name there. Uh, appreciate everybody for watching, 73, and I'll see you when we do APRS.